Hello, I'm Dean Karstens, and this is Dean's N-Scale Trains. Today, I'm not going to be talking about my latest railroad construction, the Conejos Valley Railroad. Rather, I'm going to be talking about a big problem for beginners and experts alike, that is wiring. In the early days of my model railroading experience, I had a Lionel train set, and it came with a transformer, which was a power supply, a couple of short leads of wire, and a little thing gadget that clamped onto the rail. You put the two wires, connect them to the transformer, to the connector, snap it on, and you were done. Trains were running. Companies like Bachmann, when they sell their train sets, also have a section of track with wires coming out of it that connect directly to the transformer or power supply. But when you're wiring a larger or more complex layout, perhaps with a bunch of switches and so on, things get a little bit more complicated and you have to dig into it and really look into how you're gonna wire it. We'll talk about that. So here's an outline of this video today. First of all, what do you do when joints, rail joiners go bad? How do you fix them? How do you find them? Then I'll talk about using a multimeter to test track. And finally, I want to give a few hints on soldering joints or wires. Here's a simple loop layout that I want to use as a first example. It consists of four straight sections and four curved sections. The slashed blue lines represent where the rail joiners are. I've colored the inside loop inside rail red and the outside rail black. We'll talk about that later why. Now first thing I want to show is why you might want to have multiple sets of leads going to the track at various parts of your layout. Here I've wired the railroad to the power supply using one set of leads. The green circles with arrows represent a, a voltage measuring device and as you can see, when it's green, it means it, it's, it's indicating proper voltage. And you can measure the voltage at various places around the uh, layout, like here. In a later part of this video, I'll talk about where you can get an inexpensive uh, multimeter and then show you how to use it. Here I show you what happens when you get a one rail joint is bad in your loop. I've indicated that. Uh, as between the two upper straight sections, as you can see here. But the voltage, as indicated by the various meters, is okay all the way around the loop. But what happens when you have two bad rail joints? In this case, say they happen on opposite sides of the, of the track to the, on the different rails. If you look carefully at this diagram, you can see that all sections are still connected to both sides of the power supply. So as you can see, a train will still run around properly powered everywhere on this layout, wherever it is on the track. Now what happens when you have two brakes in the rails on the same side in one section? As you can see here, there will be no voltage for that section, and when the train hits that point, the engine will just stop. There are two solutions to these bad joints. One, you can solder them, or two, you can solder jumper wires to the section and run the two jumper wires, in this case red and black, and connect them to the power supply. So with time, rail joiners can go bad, either from corrosion or by getting loose or whatever. To prevent future problems down the line, I like to run multiple jumpers to various parts of the railroad. Here's an example, my Conejos Valley Railroad. The railroad has two loops, and I've run two sets of jumpers to each of the loops. I brought each back to a terminal block, and that's connected to a power supply. So far, I haven't had any problems with any, any of the sidings. They've all been powered. But if that happens that one or more of the sidings become un, 
lose their power in the future, I will just run additional jumpers as that happens. Here's a photo from underneath the layout showing the four sets of wires coming back to the jumper block. Use a slow drill to twist the wires together as I've shown here in the photo. And here's a photo of all the wires coming together in a junction block and another two wires going to my power supply. So here's the sort of wire I use to wire up the leads to the track. It's uh, 22 gauge. I got a box of seven colors and now I've only got three left and the reels sit in this little box to make it handy to use. So here's an example of one of the multimeters that you can buy a digital multimeter. I've had this for probably 20 years but it's very handy. Uh, I like it because it's auto ranging. You just select voltage, DC volt, AC volt, or ohms. Here's an example of how it works. A nine volt battery connected to the terminals. And you see after a few seconds, it uh, settles down and auto ranges. In this case, it's almost nine volts. Here's another example. It's something that I bought uh, last week on Amazon. It cost about 12 bucks. Uh, it has AC, DC voltage here, ranging from 500 down to 0.2 volts. Uh, ohms from 200 meg ohms, which is 200 million ohms, down to two, 200 ohms. And two AC volts, AC ranges 500 and 200. So this one, you have to choose your range. See, 500 is, is not good. Let's try 20. There you go. 8.96. Now I've got these leads on the wrong terminals, so it read negative. Turn them around and it's positive 8.96, which is pretty close to what the other one said. Uh, this also has a light. And if you want to, if your measurements are jumping around, which they're not in this case, but you can uh, press the hold button to hold it. So it's very nice and relatively inexpensive, very inexpensive. People are intimidated by soldering, but it's easy if you have the right tools. This is a soldering station that I bought oh, a few months ago. It's kind of handy. You can also get what is called a pencil soldering iron. Looks like this, but it plugs into the wall. My problem with that is it tends to, uh, the tips tend to go bad quickly. So this thing has a temperature controller, a way to clean your when it's hot, you just run it, run the point through there, and it cleans it, and a number of extra points. I just mostly use this uh, pointed one, this needle nose or whatever. So you plug this in the wall, turn it on, and you can set the temperature. I usually set it for about 300 or 310. Uh, if you wait a few moments, it goes back and measures the actual temperature. You can see it's warming up pretty quickly. Now, there are two kinds of solder. This is a roll that I got from Radio Shack quite a while ago. It's a uh, rosin core solder. The rosin helps to uh, clean up the metal as it, as it, uh, when the solder melts. You don't want to use acid core solder because that'll corrode your rails or wires or whatever, but this is made for electronics. 
This is something new, a lead-free solder wire. Modern electronics these days are made without lead. So uh, I find you can use either one of these. This has to be heated up a little bit hotter, and I actually prefer this. But this also has a rosin core. Okay, here's a couple sections of track I want to solder together. I'm putting this down so I can protect my mat. Start by wetting your iron point. That means just let a little bit of solder melt there. Clean it up. And then start heating up the joint. When it gets a little hotter, you can just start feeding in the solder. You don't want to overdo this. Let it cool. And that's it. Now, what if I want to solder a wire to the rail at some point? I do the same thing, except in this case, tighten up. This is just a vise that I'm using to hold it. See how nicely that wets it? Okay, the best way to hide your joint, hide your wire, is to uh, solder it to the rail joiner. So I put it on a piece of uh, rail. You do this out, you can do this on your bench. So you can see it's shiny with solder. Solder that. Now, if you move it while it's cooling, you get what's called a cold solder joint, and it doesn't look good. It looks all It looks all bumpy and cracked, but you can see this is a nice tight joint. And you can slip it on as you're assembling the track, run the wire through the, through the uh, road bed and the baseboard, and it's completely invisible. There you go. So that's it for now. If you'd enjoy this video, please give me a thumbs up. And if you want to see more of my videos, please subscribe to my channel, Deans and Skill Trains. Thanks for watching, and thanks to all my subscribers. I really appreciate you all.